Good morning. Uh, let's open up our Bibles together to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. As you're turning there, just a reminder, uh, Jesus is in his last year of ministry. He's, he's wrapping up his time in the Galilean region. Uh, that ends around uh, chapter 9, verse 51. And from chapter 9, verse 51, he starts making his way to Jerusalem. It says he set his face to go to Jerusalem, where he's going to die on the cross for our sins. The religious leaders are plotting his death. And so all the way from chapter 9, verse 51, to Luke chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus is making a, a winding path through the villages and, and the towns, working his way back up to Jerusalem. This is what we find in verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Now, as Jesus is going through those towns and through those villages, here's what he's teaching. He's teaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Salvation is available. There's good news. He's telling people, repent. Turn from your sins. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, today, we, we still give the gospel. And many times today, as, as people are preaching the gospel, they'll say something like, okay, you just need to pray this prayer. Right, pray the sinner's prayer, and then you're good. Say these words after me, and that's it. Uh, you can have heaven, and it's as easy as that. It, it's very, very simple, and that's all it takes. Now, there's nothing wrong with a sinner's prayer. Uh, there's nothing wrong with altar calls. There's, there's nothing wrong with giving an invitation because that's what Jesus was doing. Oftentimes, Jesus is inviting people to repent and to follow him and, and this is this is our call this is what we're to do this is the great commission it, it's our great responsibility and joy and it's appropriate and it's necessary to encourage people to decide to follow jesus but the question is, is this in that invitation what are we presenting what what are we saying are, are we saying okay this is really simple J just pray the prayer pray the magic prayer and that's it you can go to heaven and you can walk out of here and you can live however you want to live what, what I'm pushing back on is something that we can call easy believism. Just simply assent to some mental facts, say these words, you're, you're good to go. The gift of, of salvation, it, it's grace, and grace is free. But to live out the Christian life, that's not simple. And that's what we're going to discover today. Look at verse 23. And someone said to him, Lord... Will those who are saved be few? The Jewish people believed that when their Messiah showed up, that he was going to save the whole nation. That they were waiting on the Messiah, and as soon as he came, everybody would have salvation. The whole nation. And he would be their savior. And then when Israel was saved, then all the other nations would come in, and they would be saved as well. And, and this is what they, they heard. This is what the Old Testament prophets said. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, they all talked about the Messiah, you know, saving, saving Israel, and then all the nations coming to worship him. And so their expectation was, okay, the Messiah is going to come, we're going to get saved, and, and then the rest of the world will be saved as well once Israel is redeemed. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, none of that was happening. When Jesus showed up on the scene, John chapter 1, verse 11, John the Apostle says, he, he came to his own, and his own received him not. The religious leaders at the moment, they're rejecting Jesus. They don't see him as the Messiah. They want to do away with him. And, and when the disciples look around, they're, they're looking around, and all that they truly see as true disciples is just a small little ragtag blue-collar group. Yes, there's a bunch of people showing up. There's large crowds for the free fish. There, there's a whole bunch of people showing up because Jesus is a powerful teacher. But when they look around, it's really just a few individuals who are trusting him. And, and so this is a legitimate question. Will, will only a few be saved? Jesus, no offense, but, but we just, we figured this would be a whole lot bigger than this. We thought there'd be more of us. Will only a few be saved? See, the, the, if they would have considered, though, their history. If they consider their history, they would have realized that it was never something large. It was always something smaller. It, 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 as they look back over their history, and, and they remember when God wiped out the wicked upon the earth, it was only eight people 
saved upon the ark in Noah's family. They would look across history and they would be able to see every time the nation was conquered, there was only a small remnant that was saved. They would be able to see that it, it wasn't a lot of people. The illusion is, is that all of Israel was going to be redeemed and saved in that moment. But national salvation doesn't exist. They, they don't get into the kingdom just because they're Jewish. You're not saved because you're Jewish. Just like you're, you're not a Christian just simply because you're an American. That doesn't exist. And so it's a legitimate question. Will only a few be saved? And here's how Jesus responds. Verse 24. Strive. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And so Jesus, he, he's responding. He, he knows the number of people. But the important part isn't the number of people people what Jesus is revealing it's not the number that matters what matters is that you're in that number what matters is that you are one of those that will make it through this narrow door but here's the deal what does Jesus mean by strive what does he mean by many will seek to enter but won't be able to do that I mean this makes it sound like salvation is hard that salvation's difficult Jesus says in order to get there, there's going to be some exertion. It's going to be a struggle. He says the door is narrow, and you're going to need to strive to get through it. That word, the word strive in the Greek, is the word agnizomai. Agnizomai. It's where we get the word agonize. It's where we get the word agony. It means to struggle. It means to fight, to strive. This, this word agnizomai, it shows up eight different times. It, it means agony or, or struggle. So this is our key word, agony. And, and it, what does Jesus mean by this struggle, by this striving, by this fighting? Well, I think if we begin to look at the other places where we find this word, we begin to see what he's talking about. For instance, uh, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul uses this word, agnizomai. Let, let me read this to you. We're going to get an idea of what Jesus is talking about. Paul writes, every athlete exercises agnizomai, self-control in all things. They do it, they agnizomai, to receive a perishable wreath. But we agnizomai to receive an imperishable wreath. So, Paul says, I don't run aimlessly, I don't box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So what are, we, what are we striving? What are we struggling for? Self-control. We're struggling for self-control. Remember Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross and deny himself daily and follow me. So our struggling, our struggling is a striving against our flesh. It's a striving against our pride. It's the striving to have self-control in our own lives. This is about self-denial, taking up our cross. E even if it would mean that as a Christian, you, you end up dying physically. Right? Jesus said, Who whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So to the, enter the kingdom of God, it is about a striving against our pride, against our flesh. We're, we're trying to get through a narrow door. And the door, by the way, you know who the door is? Jesus. Yes, Sunday school answer. Jesus. Jesus said this in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So the striving is letting go of our own life and that thing that wants to set itself up on the inside of our heart to, to be our own God to be our own Lord, that would be prideful and say, I don't need a Savior. I don't need to repent. I can make my way to God on my own. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and be my own God and set my own standard of living. So the agnizomai that we have is a struggle against that thing on the inside of us that battles and wages this war against God. It, it is letting go of idolatry. It's letting go of possessions. It's letting go of our pride and agnizomai having this 
agony as we continue to pursue God rather than our own flesh, rather than our own desires. See, that this, this gospel calls for self-denial. And self-denial isn't easy, is it? It's awfully challenging. And it's a narrow door, and it's a narrow road. There is, however, a broad road. Like, if you want to take the easy way, take the broad road. Follow the rest of culture. It's not difficult. It's not challenging. Just continue to feed your own appetite. Continue to make yourself Lord of your life. Determine your own standards of right and wrong. And you can follow the broad road right through the broad gate straight into hell. That's easy. So many people are unwilling to agnizomai, to battle their flesh, to battle the pride that would keep them from bowing their knee before the Lord God Almighty. James chapter 4 verse 6 tells us that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The way that you get the grace of God is through humility, not setting yourself up as God against the one true God. It is an agnizomai. It is an agony as we continue to battle against this world, the flesh, and the devil that comes at us so that we might enter through the narrow door, which is Jesus Christ. And I, I think that's what everybody wants, even people who are on a broad ro road. I'm not saying that people don't want heaven, who aren't taking this, this agonizomai, this agony of battling. People want heaven. Like it, Most sane people, if you say, oh, all right, do you want to be in heaven or do you want to be in hell? Most everybody's going to say, well, I choose heaven, because that's going to be a whole lot more comfortable than hell. But so many people, they want the benefits of heaven. They want the benefits of knowing Jesus, but they want to continue to live their own life. They, they, they want to continue to be master and Lord over their own lives. And Jesus comes along and he says, no, you need to strive. You need to do battle against that thing in you that would set itself up against God. And again, I think you can find ministers today who would just simply come along and say to you, if you'll just simply pray this prayer, that's it. You can go to heaven. And you don't need to agnizomai. You don't need to do any battle against your flesh or whatever the world is trying to feed you. You make your own way and your own path because just the simple prayer will save you. But Jesus says, strive. Agnizomai. He isn't saying earn. He's not saying earn your salvation. I think he's echoing what we read from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, where Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So, so there is this part in, in which we are uh, walking alongside God, and it, it's not us earning it, but it is our participation. I, I think I found a good summary of that from an author named A.W. Fink. Uh, He's an English Bible teacher uh, in the book Studies on Saving Faith. He wrote this. He says, salvation is by grace, by grace alone. Nevertheless, divine grace is not exercised at the expense of holiness. It never compromises with sin. It is also true that salvation is a free gift, but an empty hand must receive it, and not a hand which is still tightly grasping the world. Something more than believing is necessary to salvation. A heart that is steeled in rebellion against God cannot savingly believe. It must first be broken. Only those who are spiritually blind would declare that Christ will save any who despise his authority and refuse his yoke. Those preachers who tell, who tell sinners that they may be saved without forsaking their idols without repenting, without surrendering to the lordship of Christ, are as erroneous and dangerous as others who insist that salvation is by works and that heaven must be earned by our own efforts. See, salvation is from God. It's from God, but it is not a part from our desire. It's not apart from, if you will, our will, our inclination to die to ourselves and allow Christ to be savior of our lives. And so this salvation, 
It is one in which God calls out to us to agnizomai, to battle against our flesh, our pride, our own way, and to receive him. And then Jesus goes on a little bit further. And he's going to talk about, like, there's a window of time, a window of opportunity to make this happen in your life. Watch what he says next. He kind of launches into a parable, and it's like you've got to play catch up to, to put yourself in the parable. Watch what he says. Verse 25. Jesus says, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I don't know where you come from. So the Lord here is the master. The Lord shut the door. He is telling the listeners and us, our time is limited. We are on borrowed time. He tells us today is the day of salvation. Because there comes a moment in time where if you continue to reject Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and you prefer not to agnizomai, not to, to struggle against your own flesh and your own pride and to bend your knee and receive him as Lord and Savior, that door is slowly closing shut, but it is shutting. And at that point, it's too late. And when the door is shut, and you're knocking on the outside, the Lord's going to say, I don't know you. We never had a relationship. And it's not as if this is the only time that Jesus says this. We see it also in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Let me read this to you. Jesus says, on that day, on the day that the door is shut, on the day that judgment has come to every single being that had breath in its lungs, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, emphasizing some personal relationship that they assumed. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? This would be preach. Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There comes this point at which people are assuming that, hey, you know, I, I've been a part. I've been in the church. I, I, I heard some sermons. I, I prayed the prayer. I prayed the prayer. The pastor said, repeat after me. Back to chapter 13, verse 26. So people are on the outside, knocking. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. We took communion. And you taught in our streets. We heard your word. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. So these are the people who thought that they're part of the kingdom. But they've been shut out. And they're on the outside looking in and they're saying, hey, we're part of the group. We're part of the crowd. Jesus, we heard you preach. You came to our town. Remember, Jesus, we sat down. We had a meal with you. Jesus, we, we were in church. Jesus, we preached in your name. We ran a big church in your name. And Jesus says, I don't know you. We never had a relationship. This, my friends, is a different added, agony. It is an added agony. This is agony upon agony. This is the agony to assume that you have a relationship with God because you just intended, well, I'm a good person, and I like the idea of God. You assumed that you had salvation because you came to church. You assume you had salvation because you prayed the prayer. But these are the people who are now shut out. They never agonized over their own repentance of their sin to turn their life over to Jesus Christ. They never died to themselves. They discover that they never, ever were covered by the righteousness of Christ. They did not have the imputed righteousness of Christ given to them and their sin imputed, given to him. They had a false assurance of salvation because they thought it's just a prayer it's just attendance at church. It's just about being a good person and making my own way. To, to, to stand 
at the edge of eternity and at that moment to hear the Lord say, depart from me. That would have to be, that'd have to be a knife to the heart. The slamming of a, a gavel, it's a shock to the soul. It is, it is, as Jesus says, it is a door shutting. It's like the prison door slamming shut and then echoing for all eternity. This is the added agony of assuming that, that you had made it, that you had arrived. But then to realize on the other side of the door that you were so close. You were so close in life while you had breath in your lungs. You heard the invitation. You heard the gospel. But you refused to leave your life of sin. You assumed, i got more time. I'll be fine. I, I, I can wait until I'm older. This is the added agony of remorse for eternity, the added, added agony of regret forever because it was within your grasp. And yet, you refused Christ because you can make it on your own and you don't need to repent. Surely it can't be that bad. Like, okay, so we're on the outside of a door. Jesus goes on. Verse 28. In that place, on that side of the door, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. When you look up into heaven and you realize that all of those who place their faith in the one true God and trusted him are with him and you are not. And people, Jesus says, and people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And here he's coming right back to the promise that the Gentiles will be let in. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. And Jesus is going to take this particular phrase and this idea, and he's really going to spell it out for us nicely if and when we finally get to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. <laughs> this, is, this is the moment in time which is coming, which is the end of the road. It's the end of the wide road, and it is the end of the broad gate. So now on top of the agony of, of remorse is the heart-wrenching reality that there are believers on the other side of the door who are basking in the glory of God and enjoying the supper of the Lamb for the rest of eternity, and you are shut out. This right here is eternal agony. It is the weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell where there is eternal punishment. An eternal punishment is excruciating. And I know you don't like hearing about hell, and I don't like talking about hell, but Jesus spoke about it more than anybody else in the New Testament. And he talked about more than he did heaven. Hell was not created for you. Hell was created for Satan and his demons. But when mankind fell, when Adam fell, and we say fell, I think he kind of jumped into sin. But when Adam sinned, we all sinned in Adam because we have union with him, because we're human beings. And so that, that union with Adam and his sin and the wrath, that's ours now. And because of our rebellion, what, what we have is no longer the destination of heaven and union with God. What we have hanging over us as we come into this world is death, as Romans Tells us the book of Romans says that we all have the wrath of God hanging over us. And I know that's hard to hear when we talk about hell. I know it's challenging to wrap our minds around because, you know, if God is so loving, right? This is the common question. If God is so loving, why doesn't God save everyone? Why doesn't God just save everyone? I mean, think, think about this. When, when Adam is there in the garden and he is clearly heard from his maker... Adam, the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. 
And Adam takes that fruit along with Eve, and he takes and he eats, and his eyes are now opened, and he knows he is now separated from God. And what does he do? He runs and hides. And now in the cool of the garden, the footsteps of God coming along, and what does Adam do? He's hiding. He knows the consequence. What is the consequence? Death. It is death. And in that moment, Adam would expect to just be like obliterated in the moment because that is the word of God. But what does God do? God in his mercy and in his grace doesn't wipe them out immediately. People ask, why doesn't God save everyone? The question is, why does God save anyone? We all have death hanging over our heads. Why is there a door? Why is it open? It is because your God in heaven is merciful, and he is gracious, and he is loving, and there is a window of opportunity in your borrowed time to walk through that door and to receive Christ, to be, we say, saved. And when we talk about being saved, you got to understand what we're saved from. We're, we're not saved from an unfulfilling life. We're not saved from poverty to prosperity. You're not saved from bad feelings about yourself. You're saved from God. You are saved from the wrath of God. You are saved from God to God for God for his glory. This is salvation. It is, it is about your eternity of being rescued from the agony of eternal hell, eternal judgment. And it's a window of opportunity that we have in front of us. I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come back up, and we've, we've got a final song to sing. And, and we, can, we can make this final song an invitation. And I don't know what that invitation looks like for you in the moment of getting serious with God and evaluating your own life. Maybe it looks like you just, maybe you don't even sing. Maybe you just bring your heart before God. You tell him, I, I need you. Maybe your invitation looks like coming down to the altar and just getting before him. But the invitation isn't just simply, hey, pray a prayer, and then you're good and you can get into heaven. It's an invitation to receive Christ as your master, to experience his life in you. And we, we live in a culture that, that tells us, like, you know, the... The most important thing is you just need to be open-minded. You need to be inclusive. People, people will come along and they'll say, hey, there's all kinds of paths to get to God. No, there's not. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And in this moment, you've got to wrestle with, is he lying? Did he even exist? Or is that true? Because that's exclusive. People will say, you know what? I, I, I would say, really, my God's not judgmental. Your God is. I would say, well, your God is not the God of creation. The God of all creation is the judge of all the earth. The worst thing that, that could happen in our culture is for somebody to look at you and say, well, I mean, you're just narrow-minded. How dare you? say that people are sinners and they need a savior and they need to repent of their sin and there's no other way to get to the Father except Christ. I'm telling you, I am so thankful somebody told me that. To all of the individuals in my past, I am eternally grateful for speaking the truth. I'm eternally grateful for God in a moment opening my heart to him because I was a rebel who didn't want to bend my knee. But in a moment of time, he softened my heart, and I am grateful. Jesus came to save us from the wrath of God. He came to free you and me from the grip of the enemy. And Jesus had set his face to the cross to die there in agony, to spare you and me the agony 
of hell. You and I were under the burden and the weight of sin, and it was crushing down. And your Father in deep love sent his Son, who came up under that sin, bearing it by the weight of the cross, bearing the agony upon himself in our 